Welcome to this new Sunday, Sunday the 20th of November 2022, another new day, another day we can join together here as a community of faith at Sunshine Salvos in this online space. I welcome you here this day as we worship our God together. We continue this day in our myth-busting series. Of course, last week we looked at the failures of Saul and perhaps hopefully restored Saul into a better light. Today we look at myth busting one of the most famous scenes and moments in the entirety of the Bible. You just watched it 
in its 1956 silver screen glory. Charlton Heston there holding his hands over the waters, the parting of the Red Sea. Or was it red? We'll get to that a little later. We look today at myth busting, the sea crossing of Moses. And perhaps understanding that in a more appropriate way, in a better way, but not losing the essence of that story, which is such a magnificent, dramatic story, certainly in the Bible, but in the heart and the psyche of Israel and Judaism. We're going to myth bust that, get to that a little later, but welcome. It's great that you can join us here this day. And of course, no matter where we are, no matter where you are, certainly where I am, if we're here in Australia, then we have our feet planted on land that has traditional owners. And I want to pay my respects to those owners. Where I am, I think particularly of the Wurundjeri people, of the, of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders of the past, honour First Nations leaders here in the present and also acknowledge and honour the aspirations of future First Nations leaders here in this great South land of Australia. I also want to state again, of course, the commitment of the Salvation Army Australia Territory to the process of reconciliation, achieving justice, walking alongside as a journey together with First Nations people. I also want to state again the commitment and the support the Salvation Army gives to First Nations people having their own voice enshrined at the highest levels of Parliament and also within the Australian Constitution. We gather on lands, friends, that were never ceded. They were, they are, they always will remain Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands. As we always do, we commence this day of worship in a prayer. And I invite you to join with me this call to worship prayer, which takes its essence and form from Psalm 29. In praying this morning in our worship to the Lord of the storm, we pay tribute this day to the Lord, your heavenly beings, tribute to the Lord of glory and power, tribute for the glory due to God's name. Worship the Lord in wonder and awesomeness. The voice of the Lord resounds over the waters. The glory of God thunders, echoes over the mighty ocean. The voice of the Lord in power. The voice of the Lord in splendor. The voice of the Lord shatters the cedars. The voice of the Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon, making Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a wild young bull. The voice of the Lord sharpens the shafts of lightning. The voice of the Lord sets the wilderness shaking. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the oaks to whirl. It strips the forests bare. In the heavens, everything cries glory. As the Lord ruled over the deep waters, so the Lord rules as king forever. You, Lord, will give strength to your people. And this day we, we pray, Lord, you will bless your people with peace. Amen. Gotta love those old psalms of praise that lift up God in amazing ways. And we come together and worship our Lord God, that same God who inspired the hearts of so many back in that nation of Israel, who worshipped and loved and lived for the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We're going to sing a worship song this morning. We've sung it a few times here in Sunshine Salvos in this online space. 
Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, we worship you this day, mighty God, unchanging God, God of Israel, God of Abraham. Let us worship him this day as we sing together.
we continue to lift up and exalt our God, our warrior king, that same Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, who is our God today. And after all of that triumph of praise, we're moving to a time where we can be still and reflect and bring to the Lord our prayers this day. So in an attitude of prayer, I invite you to join with me as we lift our hearts and unite our minds and our hearts together as we pray together as a community of faith for those many real issues that are prevalent in our community. Global peace, particularly in our nation, for the prevailing threat within our our health systems of our communities of COVID again, another wave that's really affecting so many people in our communities. We feel so fearful again of what this COVID pandemic continues to bring to us in wreaking havoc upon our communities, upon our health systems. Tragically, people passing away. We, we lift up this situation of COVID again in this prayer time and also those dear to us at Sunshine Salvos, of course, who require their own prayer for specific means and, and needs. Would you join with me this day together as we pray?
Amen. I have some announcements I want to bring to you this day. Our newsletter for November, you know where it is. It's exactly where it always is. It's on our Facebook group page. Have a look at it, download it, consult it. It has everything in there for what's going on in November. Ladies, I've been talking about this for the last few weeks because this event is happening right at the end of the month. Next Saturday, next Saturday, ladies, the final Shine event for 2022. You've got a fantastic luncheon awaiting you down in Lara. Saturday, the 26th of November, midday. We've got the bus going down there. If you've booked your place on the bus, great. You'll be on there and we'll get you there safely. But if you still have yet to book or commit to that lunch, then please get in contact with Captain Full because the restaurant, the venue where the lunch will be need to know exact numbers. So get a hold of Captain Full, let her know if you can make it and certainly let us know also if you'd like to jump on the bus in getting down to Lara. Next Saturday, the end of a great year for the Shine Ladies, you have a lot to celebrate. The following day, we've also got a lot to celebrate because we're going to be celebrating our kids at Sunshine Salvos. We really look forward to that because they are worth celebrating. It's so good to be in a community of faith that has a vibrant, healthy number of kids within it. The sound of children on a Sunday morning. You know, sometimes they can be noisy. Sometimes they can be intrusive. Sometimes we might even feel a little bristling at the noise and the manner of kids. But let us never forget. Let us never, ever feel as though we hold anything against our children because they are a blessing to us. There are many, many churches around who don't have the sound of children echoing in their halls and in their rooms. We are blessed at Sunshine Salvos to have a great bunch of kids and we celebrate them next Sunday, the 27th of November. We look forward to that. Bring a plate of food along as well. We're going to share together in a nice big lunch. It's going to be one to remember. Don't miss out next Sunday. Of course, then we move into Christmas and there's going to be a number of things that are happening at Sunshine Salvos in December. Certainly, they will be made clear within the newsletter when it comes out. But I do draw your attention, even at this stage, to the fact that there will be, through the month of December, Christmas gift wrapping at Sunshine Marketplace that is confirmed through December. If that's something you've been a part of before and have enjoyed, then jump on the team again because we really will need all hands on deck to get the Christmas wrapping done for 2022. We have also been Christmas wrapping at High Point. We're not going to be doing the High Point wrapping this year. We hope to return to that next year. There's also, of course, going to be collecting Christmas collecting at Bunnings in Maribyrnong. I know our dear friend Jenny Scanlon's got her hand up already and has booked her place for that. But if that's something also that you might be able to assist with, let me know. We'd love to have you on board helping with our fundraising for Sunshine Salvos, our Christmas appeal. There's also on Christmas Day going to be opportunities. We're going to be having our Christmas Day community lunch again. If you can spare, a couple of hours on what is a very busy day and often a day that we're caught up in our own family celebrations. But if you have an availability and the opportunity to serve, then come down to Sunshine Salvos on Christmas Day. We'll be doing our Christmas lunch again. So there's lots of things coming up for Sunshine Salvos, certainly in the month of December that are Christmas related. And to give you that final date again, that we will be having our Sunshine Salvos annual carol service on the 11th of December. That's Sunday the 11th. It's the second Sunday in December. We look forward to that. We're going to have the Sunshine City Community Band back with us as we have traditionally done, but we've certainly missed out on that the last couple of years. We're going to be returning to 
a wonderful afternoon carol service on the 11th of December with all of the trimmings, with all of the things that we enjoy at Sunshine Salvos. I'll be elaborating on our Christmas plans, certainly in announcements in the coming weeks as we very quickly descend into the madness of December and the celebration of the Advent season. And I think that's all the announcements I want to make for this day. We're going to sing together a song that I think I've only put up once, perhaps twice in the past in this online forum of worship. It's a lovely song and it's sung by the Sydney Star Songsters, a great choir based in Sydney of Salvationists, who sing this morning and will bless us with the song that's entitled Lead Them Home. It's a song that reflects on the world we live in and how we often enter into the trauma, the pain and the grief of others who we journey with through life. Those who find themselves vulnerable and hurt at times who we can come alongside and as that song title suggests that we can help to lead them home, to lead them back to Jesus. I guess it's a song that also fits in with the theme of what we're myth busting today because that was really Moses' heart. It was the heart of God in wanting to lead his people home out of slavery, out of negative circumstances to lead them home into something better. We're going to sing that song right now. Would you join with us as we sing? Lead them home. See 
May God continue to bring people into our midst who we really are called to have a ministry to and to serve and to love and embrace and help even to lead those people home to God. The scripture this morning is a long one. Far, far better for me to bring it to you in a video format. So we're going to watch that video now. It's taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 13, some selected verses, 17 to 22, and then the entirety of chapter 14. Of course, it's much better to watch that in video form. I invite you to do that now as we encounter God through his living word. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, If they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Exodus chapter 14 Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp near Pihahiroth, between Migdol and the sea. They are to camp by the sea, directly opposite Be'ela Zephon. Pharaoh will think, The Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with them. He took six hundred of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pihahiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, 
who had been travelling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with the wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses his servant. And may God give us wisdom and understanding for how we understand that text to receive the truth of it and to understand it according to the context of today. There's a good chance if you've been around a few years on this planet that you might have been watching TV and it might have been one of those times of the year when it could have been close to Easter or maybe even Christmas. It doesn't seem to matter too much to TV people these days because if there are times of the year generally that are religious or church based in what's going on around in the community, then often the Ten Commandments movie will get put on, which of course doesn't really have a whole lot to do with Christmas, but that doesn't seem to matter to people on television. It's a long movie. It's a famous movie, 1956, Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner and the whole cohort of people put together this movie, The Ten Commandments. And of course, earlier in the service, we watched that famous scene when Moses raises his hands, stretches out his staff and says in his deep, bold, manly, masculine voice, behold his mighty hand. And the waters part. The Israelites who'd been in captivity in Egypt pass through the waters, they get to the other side and Moses instructed again by God to raise his hands but then to drop them in the waters, close back in upon the pursuing Egyptian army in their chariots and their horses and the waters converge and submerge upon them and they are wiped away. The question we have this morning, of course, is what was the water that actually got parted? It's always been in Christian tradition, of course, you ask anyone, what was, this, what was the water? What was the sea that Moses parted? It was the Red Sea. But it's interesting because even in the text as it was read, and as you followed it 
in written form, even when it comes to that moment when it says that they arrived at the Red Sea, there is a little marker next to that word red. There is a little A with a note at the bottom of the text. And if you looked up in your Bible, then I'm sure you would have it there as well. There'd be that little marker that says, look down to the bottom because there's an extra note you need to understand here. And most Bibles, even in English these days, when it says Red Sea, will direct you to a note at the bottom that says Read Sea. That cannot be overlooked. And that's what we myth bust today. We myth bust that simple error that was actually a simple, literally, literary translate. I've got to get this right. It was a simple literary translation error that misrepresented the Reed Sea into English as being the Red Sea. Someone spelled it wrong. Can you believe it? That big grand moment in the history of everything in the Bible and Charlton Heston and all of the glory of it, someone spelt the name wrong. It was the Reed Sea. Not the Red Sea. We myth bust that today. And what say, okay, that's simple. We've myth, myth busted it. Let's all go home. Well, you already are home. If you're watching this, chances are you are home. We're going to keep going because there's a little more we want to talk about in this myth busting today. Because yes, Moses leads his people of Israel who had been held in captivity and slavery. He leads them to a body of water. Let's say right now it is the Reed Sea. It's not the Red Sea. That's important because when we consider the Red Sea, we're considering a body of water that is a massive body of water. Truly, if God or if some natural phenomenon parted the Red Sea in a way that's often depicted through the television, film and screen. If that happened at the Red Sea, then the Israelites would walk through. They would have been walking for weeks because that sea is vast. It is huge. It is a massive body of water. It's not the sea that the Israelites came to. That sea, which is correctly spelt and interpreted and understood as being the Reed Sea, that's a far different thing altogether. Now, the interesting thing about the Reed Sea is no one actually quite knows exactly where it is because Reed Sea isn't a name that certainly comes up if you look at an atlas or if you look at a map of Egypt, it doesn't just have a reed sea as a, as a lake or something there. It's a description of a body of water in a very literal way. It was a body of water that had reeds in it. And you might think, oh, well, OK, we'll, we'll look for the body of water then somewhere in the projected pathway that Moses led the people out of Egypt that had reeds. Well, the problem is, there's actually a lot of bodies of water in Egypt, and they all have reeds. They're all offshoots of the Nile in some way or form. They all have reeds. So we're never actually going to completely know where exactly this body of water that was called a reed sea or described as a reed sea, where it actually is geographically. It was somewhere within the realms of a general direction that Moses was leading his people out of slavery back to the lands of what would become Israel. Of course, at that time, it was Canaan. It was a promised land that the people would be led back to. So we myth bust this today, quickly establishing that it wasn't the, Re the Red Sea that Moses crossed. It was a reed sea. Chances are it was a much smaller body of water. Chances are 
the manner by which those people crossed that sea was meteorologically, or at least in natural phenomena, probably the result of tidal influence and wind that caused an opportunity for the water to be low upon that body of water to the point where people could cross it. And so that's what we can assume, therefore, if we are going to take this Exodus sea crossing of Moses, at least as an event that really happened, then we can at least assume that they crossed over a much smaller body of water that had a lot of reeds in it. That's how it was described as a result of tidal and wind influence at a particular moment when they could cross that body of water safely. Now, here's where it gets interesting, really interesting. You would think for such a monumental cataclysmic moment as it's presented in the Bible, as it's presented and lived out in the psyche of Jewish people, of the Hebrew faith, of Judaism, in the world today, even today. This salvation event that for the Jews is still the primary, primary salvation event of their people, of their nation, of their faith. You would think that this amazing moment when a whole bunch of people fleeing slavery crossed this body of water to escape the Egyptians, you would think that there would be some account of this incident archaeologically, historically recorded. Now, of course, we have the biblical record of it. But we remember, of course, as we looked at last week, we're mindful of who wrote these accounts and what their agenda was. Well, of course, this particular event, as we understand it and read it in the Bible, was written by people from within the temple of Israel, the temple of Jerusalem, and that they are writing to describe the victory, the moment of emancipation of the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, that salvation event. And they are writing it with all of their bias and with all of that slant of history. It's often asked, well, what does the other side of the story say? Because the Egyptians were just as much a part of this story. They were the ones who'd held the Israelites in captivity and slavery for years. And this bunch of people who would become a nation this tribal confederation, escaped the land in a miraculous way, or at least in a very unusual way, crossing this body of water, you'd think there'd be some record of it within the annals of Egyptian archaeology and Egyptian history. You'd think that there would be written on a temple somewhere in hieroglyphs of the Egyptian historical records of what was happening in whenever this event took place. You would think it'd be there. There is nothing, nothing written of this event. There is nothing written of a person whose name was Moses or Moshe, as his name is in Hebrew. There is nothing written specifically of tribes of Israelites in captivity, in slavery, in Egypt. There is nothing written of it. Now, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen, but it does mean that we then have a lot of questions about, well, what exactly was the nature of the Israelite slavery in Egypt? What was the nature of their escape? Was it as earth-shaking an event as what we have held it up to be within Christendom in the history of the church. It's not a question of, well, is it true? Did it ever really happen? Was there ever, ever really actually even a person called Moses? We're not asking that question. But what we are asking the question of today is how do we reconcile the fact that there is nothing of this event 
that comes up at all or nothing of, of evidence of even the communities or people of Israel in Egypt at that particular time, whenever that time was. Nothing of what we read in the biblical account of an enormous calamitous tragedy that befell the Egyptian army in wiping them all out in a, in a huge wave or wash of water. There's nothing of it. How do we reconcile that? What does it mean? Again, I'm not saying this story isn't true. There is truth in the biblical stories that we hold on to, that we celebrate, that we study, and that we come and try and learn to understand, especially in our context today. There is truth in all of those stories if we're willing to find the truth. It may not be a literal truth, but it doesn't mean that there is not truth there. So what happened? What do we conclude? Well, the simple answer is we don't fully, absolutely know what happened. We don't even know the body of water that the Israelites came to, other than the fact that it's described as a body of water, a sea that had a lot of reeds in it, and that they crossed it and that the Egyptians who were pursuing them tried to cross it, but they weren't successful. And that eventually, after a lot of wanderings in the desert, mind you, 40 years of it, eventually the tribes of Israel crossed over into a land called Canaan, a land that they believed was promised to them, a land of milk and honey. We know from the Bible account that story. We don't know exactly all the details of how that really played out. But what we can understand and what we can appreciate is the truth of that story. It is a story of emancipation. It is a story of salvation. All of us at some point in our lives have been slaved, enslaved to something doesn't mean we've been enslaved to, for example, alcohol or drugs or some addiction that has held us and rendered us captive to its whims. It doesn't mean that it's something outside of ourselves in a substance form. But all of us at some point have been enslaved to something, whether it's grief, whether it's bitterness, unforgiveness, whether it's fear. We've all been enslaved and in truth probably still remain enslaved to something in our lives because we're human and we're all the same in that. None of us are different. What the truth of this story reminds us is that God is a deliverer who takes us and can bring us into new realities out of places where we have been held captive, where we've been stuck, where we, where we have just been enduring life in the worst way. And he can take us into new places through a process of salvation. He can deliver us to better places in life. That's the truth of this story. That's the truth of salvation. It's the precursor story within the Bible, of course, within the history of Judaism that ultimately will find its expression in and through the person of Jesus Christ, the ultimate deliverer and redeemer, saviour of the world, of all reality. And so when we consider this ancient story of deliverance of a people out of captivity, we very quickly can understand the spiritual truth of that story that speaks deeply into our hearts and it reminds us again, it says to us, we also have a salvation story. We have a story for our own lives. We weren't held captive in a place called Egypt. We didn't have to cross over a body of water no matter where it was or what it was called. We mightn't have even needed a huge miracle of God to get us from where we were to where we are 
in a better place. Although sometimes those miracles still do happen. But what we have is a salvation story. And that salvation story for the people of Israel really is the prototype story that should be preparing them for the coming of the Saviour. Who has come? His name is Jesus. The tragedy, of course, is that so many within the faith of Israel have still yet to understand that that salvation has come and they still wait for their ultimate redemption, for that ultimate Red Sea crossing through a Messiah. He has come. We understand and live in the salvation story of Jesus now. He has parted the waters for us. He has made the way clear for us to approach the throne of grace, to come into the Holy of Holies and to have a relationship again with God. He has come and he has saved us. And we live in that salvation story just as that ancient salvation story came and prepared our hearts for out of slavery into freedom in Christ. So we myth bust this story today. It's a quick myth bust because we can myth bust the Red Sea and the Reed Sea and we can clarify that point as even our Bibles do. But what we also myth bust is the fact that we don't know all the details. We don't know the absolute historicity of this story. It's perplexing that there is no account of it at all that's in evidence by Egyptian history. That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of rational sense. So we don't know the historicity. We don't know the exact factuality of this story, but in many ways we don't need to because the truth of this story is the truth we live in every day, that our God is a deliverer. And that's what's important. That's what we hold on to. That's our experience of faith. That's our blessing. That's our reward, the salvation of God that has come in and through the person of Jesus Christ. May that be the truth of this story, this ancient Exodus story. May that be the truth we hold on to, that we come back to again and again. That it's actually not about Charlton Heston or the character of Moses holding up his staff and the waters parting. It's actually more about the person, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, with his arms outstretched, parting the way for us to again be able to commune with God in relationship. May that be the truth of this story that we hold on to. And may it be the blessing and the joy and that deep place of hope and real joy in our own lives, in the walk of faith, our journey every day. Let's pray. We thank you, God, for stories like the Moses story, like the Reed Sea Crossing. We thank you for them because they really do point us to deeper truths within ourselves, within our own salvation story. We thank you, Jesus, because you are our saviour. We thank you for your life. We thank you for the consequence of the way you lived that ultimately placed you on a cross we thank you for your resurrection and the gift of eternal life and that we can live fully and freely now in grace and in your favour. Lord, we thank you for our salvation. Continue to bless us, Lord, in that deep place within us that falls back in joy and in hope upon your salvation that's very real to us in our own lives. Bless us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The prayer of benediction I leave with you, a blessing for this day and the days ahead. May the love of God the Father and the grace and the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and in the days ahead. Amen. God bless you this week. Thank you for joining us here today. 
Next week, of course, as I alluded to before, we're going to be celebrating our kids at Sunshine Salvos, but we're still going to be here in this online space. There won't be many kids around. In fact, there probably won't be any, just this big one. But what we are going to do next Sunday is we're going to continue the series of myth busting. We're going to particularly myth bust that very well trodden out that idea that really does need to be myth busted that children should be seen and not heard and we've all heard that expression we've all probably felt that we'd love that to be true sometimes if we're being honest but we're going to myth bust that that very misguided philosophy we're going to myth bust it because Jesus myth busted it. We're going to go back to that moment when Jesus really did myth bust that whole idea that children just should be seen and not heard and not appreciated. That's next week where we celebrate our kids. In the meantime, celebrate life. Stay well. Continue to take care out there with so much COVID infection around. Be blessed. God bless you. Bye for now.